Well, good morning. This is week six of our series of messages called Identity Theft. Identity Theft. We live in a world where it's easy to lose our identities. You know, I just got another email just yesterday that there was a data breach at Dell Computers. And I tend to buy Dell laptop computers. But personal information and possibly identities stolen. In our world, identity, the who I am, is often defined by what I have, what I do, my profession, my family, who I love, who loves me, all of which can change and does change, sometimes at a moment's notice. But we are people who want security, stability, a core of who I am, even in the midst of our constantly changing lives. Now, this is our last message in this six-week message series of identity theft. So, where have we been? I am one in whom Christ lives. That's my core identity, and I hope it's yours. And of course, you know, Christ in me is by invitation. For God does not go where he's not invited. I am one in whom Christ lives. And so the entire series has been an explanation, an exploration of what that means and what we did and are doing that as we walk together, we find that out in Romans chapter 8. And what we found so far is that we are those who are in Christ are forgiven, rescued by grace. Understanding that grace is so much more than forgiveness, it includes the power to live as God intends us to live, the strength to resist the pull of self and sin. That's another one. And grace is God at work in you to accomplish what you cannot do on your own. So forgiven, rescued by grace, and then child of God, beloved. Then saint, yeah, saint, already and not yet. Already a saint, but not yet fully formed. And then members with benefits. Benefits in the here and now, longer life, better family relations, better mental health, but also benefits in that God, the Holy Spirit, actually intercedes and prays for us. I am one in whom Christ lives, and the Holy Spirit intercedes and prays for us. So, what is the impact? How does all this affect our everyday walking around lives? What difference does it make? that the Spirit is alive and working in us. That's the focus of this last section of Romans chapter 8. It's the summation of the entire book of Romans up to this point. It's about God's faithfulness. It's about Christian happiness. It's happiness that is deeper and richer than ordinary happiness. It was C.S. Lewis that said, I didn't become a Christian to make me happy. A good bottle of wine can do that. I became a Christian because it's true. So no, not that kind of giddy happiness, but a happiness that is much deeper, happiness that we might better call joy. So happiness that is just this with thanks to Tim Keller for his particular phrasing. Bad things turn to good, good that can't be lost, and the best is yet to come. So it's Romans 8, 29 to 30. Let me read those for you. We know that all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, 
in order that he might be the firstborn within a large family. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. Those are the words of God for the people of God. Let's pray. Father, take these words, take my words. May the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart, be acceptable to you, my rock, my redeemer, and friend. Okay, so, bad things turn to good. Romans 8, 28, all things work for the good of those that love God and are called according to his purpose. It's a verse that many of us have heard through the years, and, and we keep coming back to it. In fact, I would not be surprised if more than one of you listening have it on a postcard on the refrigerator, in a picture on the wall in your homes, maybe on your bulletin board. It's one of those blessing box kind of quotes, or for me, one of the note cards that I have in a stack on my desk with quotes and verses that I want to go back to and thumb through every now and again. But, but I have to tell you that that verse often gets kind of twisted in how we hear it. We can hear it as all things will be good for those that love God. Somehow, we who follow Christ will have an easier life. And in fact, there are some who turn away from Jesus, who turn away from the church because that belief that things would be better, and they didn't. So then Christianity is not true, or at least not true for me. But that's not what that verse says. It says all things work together for the good of those that love God. Not some things all things. Not that all things are good. All things. Good things, bad things. Christians, those in Christ Jesus, are not exempt from bad things. We experience all that everyone everywhere experiences. And it's not that all things are turned into good things. How many times have you heard someone say, well, it's for the best? No, it's not. No, it's not. There's nothing good about cancer. There's nothing good about broken bones. There's nothing good about murder or crime or theft. This is not about because this something I was thinking would be good did not happen, then something better might be in store. You know, the, because I didn't get that job, because that relationship didn't work out, because, well, anyway, my bid on the house, my bid on the car, whatever, God must have something better. No, it's not that at all. It's all things work for the good for those that love God. God can take even the bad things and use them for our good in the long run, for our good. God can take and use even bad things for our good, for our formation, our, our transformation into his likeness. Bad things turn to good. And then, to good that can't be lost. Transformed into the image of his son Jesus. Image? You know, like a mirror reflecting Jesus, reflecting God into the world that he created for others to see. That's a good that cannot be lost, cannot be taken away. And that goes right back to what we talked about a couple of messages ago. The image of God in us as adopted sons and daughters of God, shaped and molded into the likeness of the family. God's family. At long last, the image of God in humanity that was fractured, distorted through idolatry and immorality is restored in Christ Jesus. Idolatry, 
know, worshiping, expecting, desiring from something other than God only what God can give. Idolatry, idols, that thing to which we say, if I can't have that, then life would have no meaning. It's the, I can't live without that, whatever it might be, spouse, child, career. Idolatry or immorality being that that's the breaking of relationship with God and others. So at long last, the image of God in humanity that was fractured, distorted by idolatry and immorality, restored through and in Christ Jesus and restored in us as we are people in whom Christ lives. It's all about the image of God made visible in those that trust in God's life-giving power and so truly worshiping and giving glory to God so that as true image bearers we might reflect that same image into the world bringing to creation the healing freedom and life for which we all long that is our vocation as children of God it's God's purpose for us in and for the world. That's a good that can't be lost. I know this sounds like, like a victory. It sounds like a victory. And you might be thinking, that's really unrealistic. You don't know the times we live in. Paul, the apostle who wrote this, didn't know what kind of life we live now with so much stress. And for that matter, things in the world that are just stacked up against us, especially against us Christians. But remember, this triumphant passage of Scripture, this all things work together for the good, is in the context of Rome. It was written to the believers in Rome in the midst of the Roman persecution of the way in the first century. It's in the 50s not the 1950s, the 50s, less than 20 years after Jesus walked the earth in Israel. In the 50s, under Claudius Caesar, Jews and Christian Jews were actually expelled and run out of Rome. Claudius Caesar was murdered, and Nero became Caesar. Well, Nero let the Jews and the Christian Jews back into Rome, but Soon thereafter, Nero started blaming the Christians for his own incompetence, his own utter mess that destroyed the economy and all other aspects of civic life. And it led Nero to the outright persecution of Christians. It was under these circumstances that were simply horrific that Paul wrote what he wrote. And in fact, the circumstances would be unbearable were it not for faith in God, the life giver that this was written. A world that was dead, a world that is dead, and we as Christ followers, as were the ancient Roman Christians, are called to reflect the life-giving image of God into the world. Why? because the life-giving Spirit of God is in and with us in our true identity as his children. So, bad things turn to good, and good that can't be lost. And then, the best is yet to come. Verse 30 said, And those he predestined he also called, those he called, he also justified, and those he justified, he also glorified. Glorified. Sharing the Messiah's sovereign, redeeming rule over all creation. When Jesus began his public ministry, he began actually announcing it. He said, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Turn your lives around, follow me because the kingdom of God is here and available to everyone. And you know, perhaps the biggest lie of the evil one is that the kingdom of God is not now. 
that it's only in the afterlife, somewhere away from God's good creation of this material world, that great mistake leads people, sometimes leads us to see this life as a waiting game when God intended it to be the beginning of new life in his eternal kingdom that includes both heaven and earth. You know, the old saying is widely mocked. He is so heavenly minded that he's of no earthly good. Well, that's right. You see, it's the opposite that is what is correct. He is so heavenly minded, that is, occupied with living in the place where God is, that he can be true minded for this world that God will one day redeem as he is already redeeming those who follow him. It's in that sense that we are glorified even now. Did you notice the verse says glorified, past tense, already happened, glorified, raised up, sharing the Messiah's sovereign redeeming rule, not heavy handed, not imposing, but like Jesus. And I know you've heard me say it over and over again in this series of messages that if you want to know what it means to be like Jesus, check it out in the stories of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Don't take my word for it. Don't take anyone's word for it. Don't even take the word of, of the chosen for it. Meet Jesus for yourself in the gospel stories. And one day, will see it in all its glory, not only see it, but be part of it. And since I've now said this several times in this series of messages, I suppose it would be a good thing for me to tell you where we're going to go next. Where we're going uh, in the next series of messages is to look into the I am sayings of Jesus, to hear it from Jesus himself, when he says, I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world, I am the good shepherd, and others. How did Jesus say we should and can understand him? But for now, for now, we still live in the already, not yet, and the best is yet to come. So, bad things turn to good, good that can't be lost, and the best is yet to come. Who am I? Who am I is one in whom Christ lives, forgiven, rescued by grace, a child of God, already not yet, members with benefits. That's who I am. That's who you are, or for some I pray, that's who you will be. Remember, it is by invitation, for God only goes where he's invited. All it takes from us is yes. So now, how do we end? Uh, Romans chapter 8, verses 31 to 39. It's the end of the chapter. What then are we to say about all these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not withhold his own son, but gave him up for all of us, Will he not with him also give us everything else? Who will bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is it to condemn? It is Christ Jesus who died, yes, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed intercedes for us. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will hardship or distress or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword, as it is written, for your sake we are being killed all day long, we are counted as sheep to be slaughtered. Now, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us, for I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.
Let's pray. Father, thank you that you have reached out to us, that you have shown us yourself in Christ Jesus, that we are or can be yours, that you indeed work all things, all things together for our good in Christ Jesus, that, that it's a good that cannot be lost and that, oh yes, the best is yet to come. Father, take these words, let them be true in our hearts, let us live them out day by day. And all these things we thank you in Jesus' name, amen. Now, hear this blessing from me. Unto him who is able to keep you from falling, and to present you faultless before the throne in Christ Jesus our Lord, guard you, guide you, keep you, and protect you. In Jesus' name, amen.